is also good to go. So. Calling to order the Monday, February 1st, 2021 regular meeting of the 38th Council of the City of Berkeley. Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll? Council Member Baker. Here in the City of Berkeley. Council Member Blanchard. Here in the City of Berkeley. Mayor Pratem Dean. Here in the City of Berkeley. Council Member Gavin. Here, Berkeley, Michigan. Council Member Hennon. Here, Berkeley, Michigan. Council Member Price. Here in Berkeley. Mayor Turbrack. Here in Berkeley, Michigan. Our first order of business this evening is the approval of tonight's agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Board. Motion to approve by Council Member Baker with support from Council Member Blanchard. Are there any changes? Additions or corrections? Seeing none, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on tonight's agenda? Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. At this time, please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the pledge. With us this evening is Deacon Dan Darga. So let us pray. Lord, eternal God, we are about to begin our meeting and we do so with the awareness that without your divine presence here at the center of our meeting, but also in the center of our lives, our work will mean nothing. We ask that you grace us with your wisdom your vision with humor and humility so that not only this meeting but all our lives will be a place where your will will be done. Lord, we pray tonight for our city. We pray for all our leaders, for those who guide us. We pray for our residents, both old and new, and especially we, re we remember the sick, those who do without, those who are suffering in any way this night. And as always, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right. At this time, we will have our first public comment section of the evening. Remember, this is for items that are included on tonight's agenda. You may present your thoughts on issues um, on those topics that we will be covering. Uh, remember, council members will not engage you in discussion, but if your concern needs to be addressed by a member of city or staff or department of the city, please email the clerk's office at clerk at berkeleymish.net or call the clerk's office at 248-658-3310. If you would like to comment, please raise your virtual hand or not virtual hand if you are here on the Zoom meeting and we can see you uh, or dial in at 1-312-626-6799 and you will be recognized by either name or your phone number. When you speak, please state your name and city of residence, and remember you are limited to three minutes. Mr. Mayor, we do have a hand raise. Um, okay. Chris, if you wanna go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, you have three minutes. Alrighty, thank you so much. My name is Chris Gopesha. I'm a lifelong resident, uh, occasional caller, and uh, I am, I, um, I live on um, Bacon Avenue right next outside of uh, Angel Elementary, which I went to school at. So I wanted to comment. Uh, I really uh, want to encourage full support for the establishment of February as Black History Month in Berkeley. I think it's a long time coming. I think it's a really great initiative. And I also really want to encourage that, um, you know, as we move forward, that we put a lot of focus on local Black history uh, to connect our, our citizens and residents um, to, to the Black history that we have in our backyard. 
because there's so much that many of us haven't even been enlightened to. And next, I want to show my full support for the third party specialized services operating assistance contract. Really encouraged by that. Um, really think there's a huge need uh, for improvement of access for all of our residents, uh, including those folks who you know, may have handicaps or disabilities. I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. And I, I think this is a great step forward. Um, I would also comment that the bus stops could be a lot improved as well. Um, fully support the adopting of community development block grant program. I think the city definitely needs to continue to seek out every opportunity in its power to minimize displacement and welcome new residents from variant income levels and stages in life in general. Uh, and then finally, I wanna also support amending ordinance number uh, 00321. I, I do not believe the city should start a battle with the ACLU over this, which they will likely uh, have to go into. And uh, the citizens should have a right to display any type of si signage relating to elections uh, as they please. The root of division in this country is not in our use of signage. Um, it is deeply rooted in much different ways, and I believe that it effectively does nothing to limit people's usage of election signage because they will just resort to using other methodologies such as their t-shirts, such as windows in their, or signs in their windows and signage on their vehicles, which we do not, do not want to get into having to uh, you know, prohibit because then we're going down a much darker road. Um, I do believe a lot of education on these topics would go a long way and how, uh, how certain things can be divisional uh, and in, in certain things, how certain imagery can affect other people. I think that would go a very long way. And with that, I, I will see my time. Thank you so much. And, and I thank you all for continuing your work here in the city. Thank you, Chris. Ms. Mathis, anybody uh, else who is next? Uh, I am not seeing anyone else's hands raised at this time. Ms. Mitchell, did you receive any um, correspondence to be read into the public record? I did not. Okay. Well, seeing no additional hands raised um, and nothing from Ms. Mitchell, we will close our first public comment section of the evening and move on to tonight's order of business. Uh, first up is our consent agenda. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read the items on tonight's consent agenda? One, approval of the minutes, matter of approving the minutes of the 38th regular city council meeting on Monday, January 4th, 2021. Two, warrant, matter of approving warrant number 1358. Three, resolution number R221, matter of recognizing and celebrating Ernest Scalzi Sr. on the occasion of his 100th birthday. Four, resolution number R321 matter of recognizing Deb DeRosa for her contributions to the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. And number five, proclamation number P121, matter of approving a proclamation declaring February 2021 as Black History Month in the city of Berkeley. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Is there a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? So moved. Motion to approve. Motion made by Council Member Gavin with support from Council Member Price. Are there any corrections, additions, or additional discussion? All right. Seeing none, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on tonight's consent agenda? Dean? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. Consent agenda has passed. We now move on to tonight's regular agenda. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number one on tonight's regular agenda? Presentation. Matter of receiving a presentation by Dr. Nat Pernick regarding the 2020 voting challenge. Well, before I hand it over to Dr. Pernick, uh, Mr. Baumgarten, do you have any exposition you want to throw in here? Uh, merely setting the stage, Mr. Mayor, uh, Dr. Pernick uh, for, I think this is the second election now, he has uh, held his region-wide voter turnout challenge. Uh, and thankfully, Berkeley was uh, on the receiving end of some of the prizes that Dr. Pernick has uh, set up in this uh, challenge. 
So we're very happy to have him here uh, with us once again to give deliver us some good news. Well, thank you and congratulations to Berkeley. Again, this is the second uh, election and we'll be doing this again in two more years. And um, it was uh, Berkeley had a turnout of 80.56%. This is according to Oakland County records. So it was 76.18. So it's a big jump from four years ago. And they came in third place. It was actually pretty close to second place, which was um, Pleasant Ridge 80.90. So you really had to, uh, in first place was uh, Huntington Woods at 85.31%. So the, there's also a prize given for any cities that got 80% of $500. And um, so I sent, um, I sent you guys uh, two checks for your charity designees. I, I hope uh, you got them. I, they haven't been cashed yet. Do you know if you've, uh, Mr. Baumgarten, have you gotten the checks? Or? We have received them and uh, we've been able to put the, uh, move them forward to our uh, friends of recreation and friends of library. So we're very appreciative of that. Okay, great. Um, so once again, congratulations to Berkeley and uh, I'll be back in two years. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Pernick. And, and while we are very happy with 80% uh, in third place, we got a little bit of work to do. I think we can maybe move up a, a little bit more to That's at least right. jump Pleasant Ridge. Uh, 85 may be tough, but no, I, I'm incredibly proud of the, the turnout in our community. Our residents are clearly engaged and they make sure that they uh, have their voices heard on election day, whatever the easiest method is for them to, to vote. And so certainly thank you for also Dr. Pernick, just for, for bringing this to light and for um, having the, the challenge and, and allowing us to uh, be a recipient of that challenge. All right, well, you're welcome and uh, congratulations again. Thank you. All right, uh, we will now move on to item number two, please, Ms. Mitchell. Motion number M321, motion to authorize the mayor to execute a third party specialized services operating assistance contract between SMART and the city of Berkeley for public transportation services, primarily designed for senior citizens and persons with disabilities. The contract period for this program is from October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. Is there a motion to approve M0321? Motion to approve. Support. Motion to approve by Mayor Pro Tem Dean, and I completely missed whoever supported. Give me a quick hand raise if you want that action. Okay, Councilmember Baker. That flashed very quickly. All right, Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, your packet includes a memo from uh, Parks and Recreation as well as the text of the contract itself. You'll notice it does look uh, eerily familiar to last year. It is uh, basically the same contract and same dollar amount. Uh, to talk about some of the good things that we'll uh, do with these funds and, and our partnership with SMART, we're joined, with Mr. Dan, joined by Mr. Dan McMinn this evening from our Parks and Recreation Department. Mr. McMinn, thank you for being with us this evening. What do you have? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, uh, members of council. Uh, what you have in front of you is the SMART Specialized, Specialized Services contract. Uh, this comes to you about this time each year. Um, as Mr. Uh, City Manager said, the amount is for the same as it has been in the past. Um, we are currently offering our transportation services uh, Tuesday through Friday for seniors and persons of disabilities who need to go to the grocery store or any doctor's appointments that they have. Um, all of our lunch trips and um, senior outings have been canceled on our big bus uh, due to the co uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, additionally, I'm just gonna take a second and thank our drivers who have gone above and beyond um, both in the senior citizen designated age group um, and they've been rip roaring and ready to go from the very beginning so I can't thank them enough and like I said you guys have seen this before so if there's any questions I'll pass it back to you. Thank you Mr. McMahon. Uh, questions regarding the SMART program that we're looking at. Councilmember Price. Yes, thank you, Mr. Min, for facilitating this program. I think it is so valuable for our seniors and um, people with disabilities in our community as a whole. I was wondering if you could just speak for a few moments on how qualified residents sign up to take advantage of this program and how much it costs to individual residents to participate. Absolutely. 
Um, so we, as I said before, we are running our transportation Tuesday through Friday right now. Uh, to be on our routes, you need to call the community center at least 24 hours. Uh, we prefer 48 hours in advance. Um, we ask for the your address and the designated area in which you're going to be dropped off. Um, from there, you will be put on our schedule. Um, we'll drop you off, and then when you're finished, you just call us. Uh, call our driver on a cell phone number and they'll come back and get you. Uh, it is a suggested donation of $3 for one way and $5 for round trip. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Additional questions, Council Member Baker. Yes, thank you. And I appreciate my colleague uh, opening that door. I think that's great uh, questions. And uh, so, Dan, just to help um, help make it clear what folks can do, would you mind giving out that cell, that telephone number for folks to call the department just in case they don't have it already in their speed dial? Of course. Um, to make a reservation, you need to call the Berkeley Community Center at 248-658-3470. Ask for transportation, and we will take care of you from there. Fantastic. Thank you again for such a great program. It's it's truly um, a great service for, for our community. Thank you. Additional questions for Mr. McMahon. He came to answer all your questions. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Dan, uh, for being with us and, and, and answering those questions as we talk about the incredible importance of this program and especially how it is still continuing to operate and provide uh, a very necessary resource for folks right now um, and thank you for all the work that you've done to make sure that this continues seeing no additional questions miss mitchell would you please call the roll on m0321 gavin yes hennan yes price yes baker yes blanchard yes dean yes turbrack Yes, M321 is approved. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, we now move on to item number three on our agenda. Public hearing, matter of holding a public hearing regarding the Community Development Block Grant Program Year 2021 application and the approximate amount of $36,290 to fund eligible projects. All right, I will declare the public hearing open at 718. And again, if you are on and you would like to uh, comment, please raise your hand. If you would like to call in right now, 1312 626 6799. We'll get you into Zoom uh, so that you have an opportunity um, to speak. Ms. Mathis. How many folks have lined up? There are none at this time, sir. All right, well, let's give everybody another minute just in case they are trying to get in right now. Okay, well, seeing nobody else, still nobody else, sorry? Nope. No? Okay. Nope. All right, we will close uh, the public hearing at 7.19 p.m. And we will move on to item number four on tonight's agenda. Resolution number R421, matter of adopting the Community Development Block Grant Program application for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Is there a motion to approve R0421? So we should approve. Support. Approved by Council Member Blanchard with support, I believe, from Council Member Hennan, who tried to get in there early on. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as the previous motion stated, the city was uh, slated to receive uh, $36,290 uh, through the CDBG program. Uh, keep in mind, uh, Berkeley is one of the communities that participates through Oakland County's program, so we won't receive this directly from the federal government, uh, but rather through uh, the county's program. So it actually is entitles us to get uh, a little bit extra than we would otherwise by uh, local governments pulling their resources. So we're very happy about this program. Uh, this year, as, as with many of our past years, we're dividing this into four subcategories. 
this would be the removal of architectural barriers, which would allow us to uh, make physical improvements throughout the city that would help those with uh, uh, mobility issues uh, or other barriers that could come up. Uh, it, it's a way to make uh, things a little bit more free and open for those individuals to move around. Uh, we also will be working on uh, dedicating a portion of this to yard services, as we've discussed in the past. Uh, this will partially fund the snow removal service that we have for our seniors. Uh, and then we are public services for disabled services. We do, uh, donate a por or allocate a portion of this to the library for large print books. Uh, and then the final portion is our annual contribution to Haven uh, to support the great work that they do as well. Uh, it's easy for me to read off these four categories here, but there's a lot of work that goes in uh, behind the scenes on this. It's a collaborative effort between our community development department, uh, recreation, public works, library, as well as finance. Uh, our community development director, Erin Schluto, really uh, helps us run point on this project. And she's here this evening if there are any specific questions. Questions on our CDVG uh, for 21-22. Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm just wondering if the uh, the portion going to architectural barriers is that going to be used uh, to complete the project we had at the at the public safety building, or is that is this a, a different category of program? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, what we're uh, proposing to use uh, those funds for is to um, update and make the sidewalks in. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, some of our community parks ADA accessible. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Blanchard, the, the public safety project was allocated through a different grant year. So it's the, that's for the grant year that we're currently in. This will be for our next grant year. Okay, thank you. Additional CDBG questions? Okay, does not appear to be any. Thank you, uh, Matt, for the explanation, Aaron, for answering any questions there. Um, seeing nobody else, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on R421? Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. We now move on to item number five on tonight's agenda. Ordinance number 0121, matter of considering a first reading of an ordinance to amend section 138-192 projections in order to provide clarity on permitted projects or projections into setback area on residential properties. Is there a motion to approve 00121? So moved. Support. Motion made by Council Member Gavin with support from Council Member Hennon. Mr. Baumgarten? Uh, just a brief introduction, Mr. Mayor. This one comes to you by way of the, the Planning Commission who brought it through its normal process. It did hold a public hearing and make a positive recommendation uh, for this body to uh, enact this into law. Uh, as, as usual, Aaron Schluto, our Community Development Director, um, uh, worked closely with Planning Commission, uh, crafted this policy with the, uh, uh, in collaboration with the City Attorney, and she's available to answer any questions you may have. Um, Aaron, anything else you want to add uh, before we open it up to questions? Uh, this this uh, ordinance amendment was really brought forth because there was some um, uh, confusion um, in, in, in the implementation or the restrictions on projections uh, specifically related to chimneys. Um, so that was by the uh, an interpretation of a former building official, as I noted in my, my memo that, that's accompanying this ordinance uh, this evening. So I wanted to give some uh, a little bit of uh, history as to why this is coming to you, because uh, some of the uh, developers, residents were, were unclear of the, the regulations and the restrictions. So. This was uh, crafted and worked on through the Planning Commission in hopes to provide clarity in the future. All right. Questions for Ms. Schluto um, on the ordinance. Councilmember Hennon? Yeah, I have 
one question and then one change I'd like to propose. Uh, first, the question, it's tangentially related um, to uh, projections into setbacks. We have a lot of uh, new builds with uh, window wells for basement egress windows. And while this doesn't apply to those, um, that I think is something that uh, there seems to be some gray area on as well. Uh, are there going to be any discussions on this going forward on window wells and and maybe we can you know codify it so it's clear going forward? Yes, thank you. Um, we did discuss that at one of the planning commission meetings uh, related to projections and window wells. Um, it is something that they decided was worthy of discussion, but it didn't fit necessarily with uh, with what we were trying to do here. So it is um, something that uh, I have noted for a later discussion and review through the planning commission process. Great, thanks. So then the change I'd like to propose for council um, is one that simplifies the language here without changing the meaning and the intent that was proposed by the planning commission. Um, I circulated this language to everyone on council earlier today, but I wanna you know, make the motion and read it for uh, the public right now. Uh, so I want to move to replace paragraphs one through three of section 138-192 with the following. Projections may extend into a required side yard setback, not more than two inches for each one foot of width of such setback and may extend or project into a required front or rear yard setback, not more than three feet. The total of all projections into a given yard shall not exceed 30% of that wall's surface area. Projections may have a foundation such as brick or masonry fireplaces, or may be without a foundation such as box fireplaces, bay windows, and other types of cantilevers, including second story cantilevers, Projections without a foundation shall be above grade at least 12 inches. So I thank you for sending that out because it probably would have been difficult for us to keep up uh, obviously there um, with the, and as you mentioned, it is not something that changes the intent. It's not a substantive change. It's more of a, just a change of how it is written. In this case, trying to make it as, as kind of efficient and digestible. Um, no changes to the last paragraph or the, the paragraph that begins in non-residential districts, um, correct? correct? Council members? Okay. Uh, council members, I, I believe some of you have seen the, the proposed just wordsmithing here. Um, I know that Aaron has also seen it as well as our attorney. Um, I do not have any concerns with the changes. Are there any, um, and also it is not substantive enough to require this to go back to you know, the planning commission, for example, we have that approval here. Are there any questions with that in particular uh, before we move forward with the rest of the ordinance? Okay, silence means assent in this case. So we will move forward uh, with that as the, the language. Now, any other questions or comments on the ordinance? Council Member Gavin. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, more just a, a thank you to Director Schluto, the Planning Commission, uh, not only for this one, but uh, probably more so for the next one, given the, the length of time that it was discussed. And um, I just think it was a, a comprehensive review uh, and a lot of time and effort put into it by both you and the Planning Commission. So I just wanted to say thank you and recognize that. Thank you, Council Member Gavin. Any additional questions? comments or clarifications? All right. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, then, would you please call the roll on 0121? Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Turbrack? Yes, and just to clarify, I said 001, it should be 001. I don't want to get the letters and numbers confused in the minutes or anything officially here. That was that was my bad. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call item number six or read item number six on tonight's agenda? Ordinance number 0221, 
matter of considering a first reading of an ordinance to add division 1.5 exterior appliances to chapter 138 zoning article 3 general provisions to provide regulations on exterior appliances on residential and commercial properties is there a motion to approve 0221 motion to approve support motion to approve by council member baker with support from council member price mr baumgarten uh thank you mr mayor uh the the process that this item followed uh mirrors the previous agenda item as well it's been through planning commission they've held their public hearing they've uh, offered a recommendation to this body uh, i do want to um reiterate what uh, council member gavin has said uh, uh many of Aaron's predecessors have, have tried this. Many uh, earlier planning commissions have, have likewise struggled through this process, but um, with Aaron's expertise and the, uh, the group that we have on planning commission now, they were finally able to get it past the talking about it phase. They've written a policy for you. And um, it, this has now come farther along than, than any subsequent version of this discussion has. So uh, great, great credit to, to Aaron, as well as our current members of planning commission. Director Spluto, would you like to uh, tell us what's in front of us here? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so as the city manager mentioned, this is the um, ordinance for exterior appliances. In our, as I noted in my memo, uh, a previous building official had noted that um, air conditioning units, generators are not considered uh, accessory structures. Therefore, we did not have any regulations in our ordinance on how to on how to regulate them, where they could go in a yard, how far away from a property line, how far away from uh, a driveway or, or, or anything else. So um, this became problematic and the policy of the building department over the last several decades has been to allow um, specifically air conditioning units into the side yard, provided that the uh, adjacent neighbor uh, signs a, uh, a letter of consent, allowing it to, to be placed in that, in that side yard. Uh, this became problematic in, in the sense where it allowed uh, an adjacent property owner a lot more um, regulation or, or they had the, almost the authority to determine what goes on someone else's property. Um, so, and then there were others that, that didn't want them at all. So it, it, it provided this, this, um, unenforceable wiggle room gray area for us where we could not force someone to put it in the backyard, but we didn't have any mechanism on where they could go. So with this ordinance, we looked at not only the, the residential component, which is where most of these uh, questions and concerns came from, but we also looked at the commercial uh, and non-residential areas, specifically a lot of the uh, external appliances uh, are, are installed on the rooftops. Well, um, Part of this ordinance allows for or requires a screening so that way uh, if you're walking on the street level you don't see the mechanical equipment on top of the the roof a parapet or some other type of screening mechanism it will be installed in order to um, to screen them um, and i know i'm jumping around here again and i apologize uh, we did provide some definitions um, to provide developers and residents uh, some understanding of what we meant by the air conditioning the power generators uh, exterior appliances. We did separate them, uh, power generators versus air conditioning units on where they could be in the yard um, with the generators regulated to the rear yard with a distance set back at least six feet from a property line. Um, whereas air conditioning units can be in the side yard um, with screening. We separated those two out. Uh, the planning commission determined that based on the, the noise level, the size of the units, uh, generators pose more of a um, distraction or, or that's not the right word I'm looking for, but um, they didn't want them to be uh, located in the same area. So based on the noise, the aesthetic appeal of, of the generators, they wanted to keep those into the rear yard. We also allowed for the non -res in the non-residential -res category, the planning commission may modify the location of these exterior appliances. Uh, given that uh, all of the properties here in Berkeley are built out and are uh, largely landlocked, there may not be a lot of flexibility for where they can place them. And we wanna make sure we can maximize not only um, the make sure they can make their parking requirement, but also they have the flexibility to 
install additional green space on the property if need be, um, or, or keep it screened somewhere that's, um, that's more conducive to, to the business. So we allowed some flexibility for the Planning Commission to make that judgment call during site plan review. We have um, restricted uh, generator testing, um, so that way they won't be tested um, at all hours of the day. Uh, two, three o'clock in the morning is not prohibited, permitted. So uh, we've regulated that to a nine to six day, nine a.m. to six p.m. Monday through Friday. We've also allowed for non-conforming ex exterior appliances. So if there is something that has been installed at this particular time that would be considered non-conforming by the adoption of this ordinance, they can continue. They can be replaced where they are. They don't need to be um, brought into compliance if something is going to be replaced. Unless the structure, which is serviced by these exterior appliances, is demolished or destroyed in excess of 50%. Wherein if they're going to, uh, if a house is destroyed or demolished, they can't put a, a non-conformity right back where it is. If they're gonna rebuild the house, then it has to be brought into conformity with this ordinance. And all permits are required for the installation of these types of exterior appliances. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. All right. As we heard, uh, this is something that we have had discussions about for a number of years. Uh, prior to this, have not been able to, to get anything codified in this type of an ordinance that seemed to have um, the agreement certainly of the Planning Commission to move forward. With that, questions uh, for Director Saluto on the ordinance or any of the highlights that she illuminated for us just a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds ago. Council Member Hennon. Yeah, just a comment. Um, I think this is a very well-drafted ordinance. I originally had some concerns about air conditioner units in between uh, residences, but reading the details with the amount of setback, the screening, and just the fact that newer models keep getting quieter and quieter, I'm satisfied with this as it is and think it'll be just fine. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I just had a question. I, I noticed that the screening requirement uh, sets a re requirement at four feet high. That seems a little excessive for most of these structures are less than three feet high, is this, uh, was this discussed at the Planning Commission? Is that what they really, what they wanna do? The, the screening was discussed at the Planning Commission and they felt four feet high was, uh, was uh, sufficient um, because sometimes the, um, the air conditioning units can be placed up on a pedestal. Some of them are, are, are up higher than others. Most of them are at grade, but some of them are up on a, uh, up on a structure like, so they wanted to give some make sure that they were, were covered in all instances that we could think of. Okay. And another subject on power generators, haven't uh, we had two or three uh, ZBA cases recently on generators in the side yard that the ZBA allowed? Uh, those were done back in 2017, 2018, I believe. Um, and they uh, one of them was allowed, yes. Okay. Well. At this point, if, if, they, if a generator requests, we do have one going to the ZBA uh, next week, as a matter of fact. And if there are extenuating circumstances, then they would be able to be granted um, just based on the, the way our ordinance is written. Um, if that does become an issue, that'll be something that we can return back to the, the Planning Commission for, um, but those are uh, few and far between. Okay, I think the ordinance is well, is well written. I just had those, those two questions. I know people are, trying to put generators in the side yard because it's a lot easier hookup, a lot less uh, wearing uh, to come from the back, from coming from the backyard. And the generators are getting much quieter than they used to be. So but, uh, thank you for the hard work on this. Appreciate it. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, point Councilor Blanchard, the, the fact that we didn't have this <clears throat> officially codified in this way led to a lot of additional questions, some additional, you know, things going to the ZBA that hopefully um, now everybody knows here's the ordinance, here's where it can be, here's where they cannot be. Uh, hopefully we will be able to put a lot of those issues um, in the past and be able to operate moving forward uh, by this ordinance. Additional questions or comments? Well, seeing none, I too, um, Aaron, want to thank you and the Planning Commission. As I mentioned at the beginning, this, this has been, I don't know, probably six or seven years 
uh, in the works trying to get to a place where we have a, a well written, well crafted ordinance that seems to fit the needs of our community and the needs of our residents as, as well as possible. Just like with anything else we do, there are always going to be people that agree and there are always going to be you know, some folks that maybe disagree and that's okay. Um, but we are trying to do what we feel is in the best interest of our community as a whole. And that's why we're moving uh, forward with this on the agenda this evening. And with no additional questions or comments, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on 0221? Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Price? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. Ms. Mitchell, would you please read item number seven on tonight's agenda? Ordinance number 0321, matter of considering a first reading of an ordinance to amend section 94-10 of chapter 94 signs to eliminate number of days to remove political signs following an election and to prescribe a penalty for violations. Is there a motion to approve 0321? Motion to approve. Support. Motion to approve by Council Member Blanchard with support from Council Member Price. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the text of this ordinance brings us into compliance with the current case law regarding signage. Uh, it, it was determined through uh, a couple of different cases uh, of, of different municipalities that there is no way to remain content neutral and have a rule that applies specifically to uh, political or election signage. Uh, therefore, the text of our ordinance, uh, as we found out when we went to enforce it, uh, did raise some flags with some of our residents, as well as the, um, our friends at the ACLU, who sent us a letter letting us know that um, uh, a slew of cases ha had been tried and lost by various communities. We don't want to be added to that list, uh, so city attorney jumped into action and uh, delivered to, before this body. A, uh, a version of our ordinance that eliminates references to uh, time limits. And as you'll compare between the uh, proposed ordinance here and the one uh, currently codified, you'll see at uh, section 94-10, uh, subsection A, and uh, underneath it, subsection 2, uh, you'll see the, the text uh, that references uh, signage must be removed within 10 days following the election to which they pertain. That language has been completely removed now. So. Uh, political signage does not is not now required, nor would the city enforce a time limit on uh, those signage. Muted myself, Mr. Starin. Is there anything you would like to add from a legal perspective? Um, on the, this? City, the city manager covered it pretty well. I would just very briefly add that. Um, these types of provisions and imposing time limits on political signs, both before and after an election cycle, um, used to be fairly commonplace. You'd find them in almost every municipality sign ordinance, but um, they just uh, no longer hold up under current uh, First Amendment jurisprudence on a number of of different reasons. And although we know that uh, we are looking at a, a sign ordinance overhaul, <laughs> when we can get to it to bring to, to make our ordinance more uh, current, uh, this seemed like a real easy one to excise and take out, uh, especially before it becomes a very uh, negative focal point. And if, if we didn't do something, we didn't excise that, what would be potential ramifications? Well, I don't think that um, it would be enforceable. Um, and attorneys often like to hedge their bets, you know, a lot of maybes and whatnot, but this one I'm pr pretty much guaranteeing you <laughs> would be invalidated if challenged. Uh, it just wouldn't hold up. There's just too many cases from the US Supreme Court down and it does potentially expose um, the city um, to to civil rights uh, liability um, as well as probably not very good for public relations. 
And um, that's, it's another good reason not to wait till it becomes another uh, focal point or we go through another election cycle. It seems like now is the time and place to address this and move on. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions from council members, either for our attorney or city manager on the ordinance we have in front of us, specifically the, the change. Council member Blanchard. Thank you, your honor. I, I think the ordinance is very good. I have no problem with that. I just have a question on the interpretation of what the setback means. Now that we're talking about this on a single family residence and we have a political sign, what actually does the setback mean to the resident? Where can they put that sign? I see nobody else jumping forward, so I'll do it. Um, so from the front portion of the property line, typically uh, somebody's property line coincides with their sidewalk. So five foot back from the sidewalk. Correct, sir. Right. So it's basically in the front yard outside of the right of way. Okay, because I know a lot of them right now are close to the sidewalk or have been in the past. And uh, just want to make sure that we get the word out in the future. They do have a tendency, uh, the closer we get to election day to kind of creep more closely to the road. <laughs> and uh, that, that happens. Uh, there's only so much we can do to uh, to, to police such things. But yes, as long as they're in the front yard outside of the, uh, the right of way, um, they're good. Thank you. Council Member Baker. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And uh, as a quick follow up to that, um, to what extent is there any setback from uh, the neighbor's property line? We've clarified that there's what, six feet back from the sidewalk, uh, which makes sense. Is there any provision that would prevent somebody from basically putting up a front yard fence of lawn signs um, abutting either, you know, both neighbors properties on either side and then going that six foot, um, six foot window or six foot uh, setback from the sidewalk? Is there, um, how do we handle the setbacks from neighboring properties? Is, are we silent on that or is that, um, is that the, already? Uh, the current uh, ordinance, the current ordinance is silent on it. Um, that's something, uh, Councilman Baker, I think is, is a very good question and something that we'll want to look at when we, we are embarking on a, you know, a comprehensive side and ordinance overhaul. And it would have to be done in a way we are allowed to do um, reasonable, um, reasonable non-content based restrictions on time, place, and manner of sign. So we would have to develop um, a regulatory scheme whereby we, we can have setbacks, we can have size limitations, that sort of thing, but they would have to apply to all signs that might appear on residential and not just political, would have to cover, you know, real estate signs, garage sale signs, you, you name it. We just can't single out political signs because that um, uh, would be content-based and also raises um, fundamental uh, First Amendment rights, which our, our courts historically have held to be of the utmost um, importance when it comes to uh, political speech from one's home. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I do have one other uh, line of questioning in just a second here, but uh, to that point, would it make sense um, to, to make note of that other section around sign ordinances in this ordinance so we don't have to come back to this one? Because uh, right now, since it's silent, um, presumably we're gonna have to come back as part of that uh, thing. Can we, we maybe skip a step and just find a way to refer to whatever other uh, ordinances are in place uh, so that when it gets fixed over there, then it automatically applies here? I'm not sure I'm entirely following you. I mean, we, we have to do a complete rewrite of our ordinance, eliminate all sign categories and so on and have something that's strictly um, um, content neutral. I and mean, that's one aspect and the other, aspect of it, which goes way beyond my 
expertise and is really more of a, a, a planning type of consideration is to just update what our regulations should be. Like for instance, Absolutely. I don't know if any of us, I don't know if any of us here have any idea what you know what the size limitations and setback limitations would be. We're gonna need, no. gonna need no, some help with that. So I think it can be done, but I think that really is part of the bigger process that's going to take some time to uh, to get deep into. Understood. Yep. I wasn't looking to shortcut that deeper process. I was simply wondering if we could be expeditious and point to the outcome of that process now so that we don't have to come back to this one later. Oh, I see what we, you're saying. If yeah. we want to bundle that this one in so that we'll revisit it in the future, I'm absolutely in support of that as well. I just wanted to see if that was an option. My other um, just questions, and this is rhetorical because certainly uh, I do support the destination of where we're going with this. And as, uh, as Mr. Capacia and others have um, has spoken, uh, this is important, uh, important stuff. So I support the destination. Uh, my concern is around the process, the journey to get to that destination. And I believe, uh, so Matt, uh, Mr. Baumgarten, I believe you hinted at this, but just to clarify, was the city threatened with a lawsuit if we did not take action? Uh my, my reading of the letter that we had, uh, we received on behalf of the ACLU, uh, I wouldn't go to, I wouldn't categorize it necessarily as threatening, but they were very clear that the text of our ordinance was the same uh, that they have prevailed against in the past. I would probably say it's the uh, it's the letter we would get before the letter that they threatened us with. Uh, I they tend started to agree. off with, yeah, giving us a chance to clarify this on their on our own uh, before saying. Uh, we'll see you in court. Excellent. It, so we got like a the, friend, we got a friendly warning then. So that's uh, it was the that's friendly that. notice before the nasty threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and I assume then how does it that the jurisprudence was established, right? So those courts they went to court, they established, uh, they were able to be victorious in one or more communities, and um, and have since set the precedents. Again, I support the destination. My question is more about uh, the journey. Um, uh, I, I guess it's not even really a question, right? Because we have to, to do this thing. Uh, I guess I'm not a fan of uh, legislation by lawsuits. Uh, and um, although we're painted in a corner here and we have to move forward, I wish it was because we wanted to move forward instead of the fact that we got a friendly warning. So my request is as we look at the sign uh, information and uh, a broader review of our ordinances, uh, I'd really like us to be in a position to proactively identify and correct things that just don't feel right from a First Amendment perspective, rather than waiting um, to be litigated against or to receive the next best thing, uh, a friendly warning. Uh, I don't like the notion of legislation by lawsuit uh, and although I will regret it, I will uh, need to support this because it's not my intent to put the city in any financial risk. Um, I just I lament how we got to this point. Although again, I, I fully support the destination. Uh, and so whatever we can do to be proactive in the future so that we don't find ourselves receiving these friendly warnings, um, I think that would be uh, that would be awesome. So um, I think that's it. There's no question in there. I think I'm just rambling. So I'll uh, I'll thank you for uh, for humoring me for a, for a moment here. Well, I, I appreciate uh, that, Councilmember Baker, and, and I know where you were going. I know we we've talked about this, and in this situation, it is something where we need to make sure that we are uh, in compliance. I don't see any reason to try to pick fights with anybody on something where it's a limiting of free speech, but I do agree that I dis thoroughly dislike the idea of legislation by lawsuits and, and we have found ourselves on, on the wrong side of typically it's more of an unfunded mandate and, and, and as opposed to lawsuits, but either way, I agree. I don't think that's the way to govern, um, but in this case where we are right now, um, we have to make sure that we're doing what's in the best interest of our community and engage the conversation, hopefully a little bit differently in the future so that it doesn't get to this point. Council member Hennon. I, yeah, and I just want to comment. Um, some of us, I had, you know, identified many of the deficiencies with the sign ordinance and there was some discussion probably more than a year ago about this rewrite um, and 
that got set aside uh, in large part because of COVID issues and dealing with the COVID crisis. So, you know, this was something that, you know, was on the radar, uh, but more urgent matters, you know, came to the fore. Thank you. Councilmember Blanchard. Another quick comment, Your Honor. On, on the, the ordinance, it says setback, five feet. Uh, should we assume that's from all sides? The way it was explained a while ago, we don't have anything that says side yard setback, but I took that as assumption it has to be set at least five uh, feet from all sides. Is, am I reading that incorrectly? Uh, I, I, or it's worth, Council Member, I made the same assumption. It says setback. It doesn't say front yard setback, side yard setback. It says setback. Uh, do we need maybe that's something we need to look at in the future? Well, or we can clarify by potentially adding, if we so desire, uh, that it's a, a you know a comprehensive setback and not just the typical front setback that I think right. most people would assume. It. Okay, just just a comment. That needs to be looked at also. Thank you, uh, Mr. Staren. Is there an issue? Um, or, or Aaron, certainly for you as well, um, if we make that an all encompassing setback. So it would be, a, I assume, in this case, only a front and a side yard setback. I think that when you do overhaul the sign ordinance, you're probably going to end up that way, where regardless okay. of the sign, you'll have setback and size and height regulations that, that apply to all, uh, not based on. Uh, you know, uh, content neutral regulations that would cover all signs. Just at this point, we cannot single out political signs. Okay. Well, I think this is, will not be the last time that we address this ordinance as has been hinted no. at a number of times. We are under going to undergo a comprehensive signed ordinance. This is um, became a little bit more urgent of a matter to make sure that we uh, rectified right now, and, and that's what we are doing. Seeing no additional questions or comments, Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll on 0321? Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turpac? Yes, uh, we now move on to our second public comments uh, section of the evening. And this is for items that were not included on tonight's agenda. The same three minute um, rules apply as before. And again, if your concern needs to be addressed uh, by a member of city staff or department of the city, please email the clerk's office at clerk at berkeleymish.net or call the clerk's office at 248-658-3310. If you'd like to comment, please raise your hand or dial in at 1-312-626-6799. You'll be recognized by either name uh, or number. And before we begin, I am going to, uh, before we open it up, I am going to reserve some time for our new state representative of the 27th district who is with us this evening. Uh, Regina Weiss, thank you for being with us. Uh, what do you have for us? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you and to hear what's going on in Berkeley. Um, I just wanted to come to introduce myself to you all. I am the new state rep for the 27th district. Um, so filling some big shoes of Representative Robert Wittenberg, who is now our new county, well, will soon be our new county treasurer. Um, he takes office in July um, and uh, uh, have been getting to work um, over the past month um, and learning the ropes. And uh, I, I'm excited to be representing Berkeley. Um, uh, I uh, have a background in local government as well. I uh, served on the Oak Park City Council up until I was appointed to the legislature. Um, so local government is a huge passion of mine, um, and I will be advocating for more municipal funding because I know you, <laughs> I know you all need it. Um, and uh, I also come with an education background. Uh, right up until right before the break, um, at the end of the 
I was teaching virtually in the, the Detroit Public School District. Um, so I'm uh, excited to be working on education issues as well. I am on serving on the appropriations committee. Um, and uh, again, I'm excited about that too, because we haven't had um, in Oakland County, at least from the Democratic caucus side, we haven't had representation on the appropriations committee. And that's super important, obviously, because that's where the money comes through. Um, and so I'll be serving on appropriations and I am the minority vice chair of school aid. Um, and I'm also serving on licensing and regulatory affairs slash financial services and insurance, as well as environment, Great Lakes and energy subcommittees within appropriations. Um, so right now I'm just learning everything I can and getting to work. Um, I, I did wanna let you know that there's a lot of back and forth going on right now around appropriations in terms of uh, some supplemental budget introductions. Uh, obviously we have some federal money coming in. We need to appropriate that money to make sure it gets out uh, for COVID relief. Um, there are a few different bills that have been introduced or are going to be introduced regarding that. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's a package of bills that was put forward um, by uh, the Republican leadership and the, uh, our caucus is gonna also be putting forward a bill um, this week uh, in order to allocate those funds. And what we're hoping for and what I'm hoping for is 90 million um, for increased vaccine distribution and speeding up vaccine distribution. I know that's a huge issue. We're hearing about it from ever, everywhere around. Um, teachers need to get vaccinated um, and all school support staff need to, needs to get vaccinated. You know, my husband is an employee of Berkeley School District and um, teachers went back just went back today and, and he's he's been working in person during all of this but he still has not been able to get vaccinated and so I know personally that's a big issue and so trying to get more funding to that to help speed up that process and get more people vaccinated um, as well as some relief uh, 2.1 billion in food assistance um, 661 million in rental and utility assistance um, 260 million for, million for small business relief because they're obviously have been, been struggling. I know I saw a report on the news the other day featuring Berkeley Commons and some of the things that they've had to do in order to um, you know, navigate through this. And a, a lot of our local businesses need, need that support um, as well as 2 billion for public schools and extending um, unemployment assistance from the current 20 weeks to 26 weeks. Um, and so those are the, that's what um, we're gonna be advocating, that I'm gonna be advocating for, but there are some competing appropriations allocations. So just waiting to, to see how that plays out, but I just wanted to give everyone an update on that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to let everyone know that I'm gonna be having my first um, virtual community conversation with Senator Jeremy Moss on uh, Wednesday, February 24th at 5 p.m. on Facebook Live. Um, and so you can get to that from my Facebook page, which is um, State Rep Regina Weiss um, or through Senator Moss's Facebook page. Uh, we, I will be doing some with Senator McMorrow as well, but as you may know already, she's currently on leave because she just had a baby girl on Friday. Um, so she gets a pass for a little bit, but we'll be doing some of those together down the line as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any questions. Uh, thank you, State Rep uh, Weiss, for being with us this evening. Quickly, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you very quickly, what is the best way to do it? Yes, yeah, sorry. Or not I even very just quickly, but just thank get you. a hold of you in general. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, if you want to get a hold of me, you can. Um, uh, email me. Uh, my email is Regina Weiss, that's R-E-G-I-N-A-W-E-I-S-S -S, at house.mi.gov. Um, and you can also call our office. Uh, the number for that is 517-802-7855. Um, and I will say that we don't, um, because of COVID, I have my staff working all remotely. So if you call, you'll have to leave a message, but someone will call you back right away because um, they're working all day. We're just calling people back from voicemails. Um, and I know unemployment, and that, that's one thing I forgot to mention. I know there's a lot of concerns about unemployment. If you're having any issues with unemployment, you live in Berkeley, 
please um, reach out to our office and we can hopefully help with, with that process. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions right now for our representative? There will be plenty in the future, I'm sure. And Regina, we look forward certainly to, to working with you, as you mentioned before, you've obviously been in the community, you've been on, you, you've been in our seats as well, you understand um, what it's like. And it is also very nice to have you on the appropriations committee so that we can bother you even more about the money that we want. Perfect. Please, please do. I've already been asking about um, uh, municipal funding and some, as come, some of those COVID dollars. And so I'm all, please bother me about it. <laughs> oh, we will. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. And, and again, we look forward to certainly working uh, with you as our representative. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I believe I saw your hand up again. Sorry, Tori, I'm, I'm jumping out of order here, but I, I saw him up. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Again, Chris Capacia, Berkeley resident, 30 years. Um, so I, I wanted to thank, thank Dr. Uh, Pernick again for his continued work and the, and the city's efforts to improve turnout in the city. I think it's really, really important. And I'm glad to hear the mayor, uh, you know, commenting to strive to improve that even further. I think we, we can continue to do a lot of great with that. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up was something called rank choice voting that uh, you may or may not have heard of. Uh, it is being utilized in a number of communities around the country, uh, even in our neighboring communities. Um, and I wanted to bring it up as something that I would love to see city council consider uh, increasing public awareness on uh, and ha having conversations about. Um, it's I, being headed up to bring it to Michigan by a nonpartisan nonprofit organization called Rank my, uh, Rank MI Vote, and you can find out more about them at RankMIVote.org. Um, I, I really think it's a great uh, a great thing to to introduce to the public because I think at this moment in time it's super important for our communities to be able to feel that their voices are heard, uh, and this gives an opportunity for folks to rank who they want the most without feeling that fear of repercussions for their vote. Uh, they can, you know, and the lo losing of their second and third choices or their first choice, you know, they have a, more of a say in this, in this methodology. Um, it's no, no surprise that many other communities are starting to pick it up because of that. Uh, and I would certainly encourage folks uh, to, to consult with colleagues and, and other politicians in Ferndale that are currently operating that. Uh, this is also in Memphis, Tennessee. It's also in Oakland and San Francisco, Santa Fe, Sarasota, Florida, uh, and many, many more. So uh, it's also no surprise that the third parties also encourage this voting method because this obviously gives another op opportunity for them to fit where, where voters that are voting for parties like the Green Party or the Libertarian Party can feel that they can vote for them first as their first choice and then rank the other ones in order of how they want them to, to go. Um, uh, so I definitely would encourage that. I also think it is another kind of what method uh, to, to get at what um, Mr. Baker said, and Councilman ba Baker said, is getting ahead of some things. Um, I think that's, you know, this is one method to kind of look at uh, on a public education side and public awareness side to see what, what the residents feel about it. I, there's also many other things we can continue to do as a community, I think, um, this is just you know one one point that I would highly recommend us considering as a city. So with that, thanks again, and have a lovely evening. Thank you, Chris, Miss Mathis. Who else? Who's next? Not seeing anyone else with their hands raised at the moment. All right. Well, I think I can see the whole. I don't have. I only have one page here, and I don't see anybody else raising their hand or clamoring to get in. Uh, so with that, we will close our second public comments portion and we will move into the next item on our agenda, which is communications. Ms. Mitchell, your choice is to you. Mayor Pro Tem Dean. Thank you. So I just want to call your attention to an article that was about the Berkeley Royal Oak high-risk response team that was in the Woodward Talk on January 27th. Um, it gave, I think, a pretty good overview of the team, 
and the things that we're currently working on. And that article is still available online. If, if you're so inclined, um, you can check it out. We are continuing to meet monthly, usually the last Wednesday of every month. And right now we're focusing on case review. Um, our Parks and Recreation Department always gives us many, many opportunities for fun and recreation and engagement. And right now they've put something pretty special together for Valentine's Day. You have the opportunity to uplift our Berkeley seniors by showing them some love with Valentine's Day cards. And I have a graphic there on the screen um, that is the Parks and Rec image. And the details are there with the guidelines, the Dropbox location and the due date. And I really hope that we can get a good response to this and we can really get behind it because the more that we do, the more seniors will have a, a brighter Valentine's Day. So think about that, mull it over, but I hope you jump right on it. Um, Parks and Rec has joined with Oakland County to bring you Winter Wonderland in Community Park. That'll be on February 18th from 4 to 6 p.m. There will be an ax throwing station, inflatables, no sharp projectiles uh, of the, any kind, two craft stations, a nature center station, snowshoeing, and they are asking for registration just so that we can adequately distance. Staff and participants will be asked to wear masks and um, start times will also be staggered. And finally, um, this is pretty, I think it's really cute and exciting that Parks and Rec is working really hard to build up a small ice rink behind the community center, um, yeah, obviously for skating. It's, it's not a hockey Olympic sized rink. It's a smaller rink for our community um, made possible through the generosity of the Friends of Berkeley Parks and Recreation. So when it's ready, Parks and Recreation will make an announcement uh, telling you come on and skate, but it is, that's not today. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Council Member Hennon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, an update from the Zoning Board of Appeals. They did not meet in January, but they will meet a week from tonight, uh, February uh, the 8th at 7 p.m. And as we discussed earlier this evening, they'll be hearing a request for a variance for a generator in a side yard. And I just wanted to comment on that, that I'm glad to see our system working. We've had several similar cases in recent years. And when you have the same sort of thing showing up over and over at the ZBA, um, there's probably some ambiguity in your uh, code that probably should be resolved. And that's exactly the steps the Planning Commission and we took here tonight. So I'm very pleased that we went in that direction. Uh, with the tree board, uh, they met with the Parks and Rec director to start working on a strategy for placing trees in the updated Merchants and Oxford Park. Um, also, we should see this year uh, an increase in our budget for funding street trees. Uh, last year, we opened it up for free to residents and we stopped advertising the program early because the list filled up so quickly. So there seems to be uh, more demand. So you know, the tree board you know, is asking that we uh, provide for that so we can maybe get some more trees into the ground uh, in our city's public places. And then uh, finally, uh, I'm glad uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dean uh, mentioned the uh, high risk response team uh, that uh, she, Chief Kane, he and Haven have worked on. Uh, I just want to thank them for uh, being involved in getting that set up. It looks like a really excellent program, and I'm really glad it's in our community now. Thank you. Council Member Gavin. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. A uh, couple quick updates. Uh, one from Planning Commission, obviously much of what uh, Planning Commission discussed last time is what we took up here uh, this evening. And again, thanks to Aaron. Uh, thanks to uh, all the Planning Commission uh, commissioners for all their work on it. So uh, there is a work session tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, and then the regular Planning Commission meeting is February 23rd at 7 p.m. Uh, Environmental Advisory Committee, they're uh, not going to have a meeting this month. Uh, but at the last meeting, uh, there was discussion about the energy plan implementation was discussed, uh, as well as 
the EcoWorks seminar that uh, myself and a couple other council members were able to attend as well, which uh, was great on the, the loan revolving fund uh, and turn, uh, figuring out how we can get it implemented here in the city uh, and what sort of seed funding might be available for that going forward. Uh, community gardens were also discussed and we hope to have a presenter at the next meeting, uh, which will be on uh, March 18th at 6.30. Uh, Mass Plan Steering Committee met and discussed how uh, further we can uh, engage residents in, the, uh, in a community open house setting uh, and continue discussions about different sections of the master plan as well, uh, with the next meeting being March 16th at 7 p.m. And then uh, recently, I've, uh, I had the opportunity to take some continuing education courses from MSU Extension on uh, stormwater management, Michigan water law, uh, community um, involvement and stewardship, water economics, planning and quality. So it's really, uh, these are ongoing. They're really, really great. Um, and I've uh, certainly hoped to be able to bring back some benefit, uh, beneficial information for Berkeley. Uh, and then uh, lastly, our first committee meeting for the Michigan Municipal League's um, Environment and Energy Committee will be on March 1st. And again, hope to be able to bring back some information on legislation uh, regarding these issues that will impact the city as well. And uh, like my colleague, uh, Councilmember Hennon, I just want to congratulate Mayor Pro Tem Dean uh, and the entire um, uh, response team about uh, such a great, uh, great addition to the community uh, and all the work that was put in uh, by each of the members. So congratulations, and that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Baker. Well, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to continue the, the uh, celebration of that great work that our Mayor Pro Tem uh, put together along with some excellent colleagues uh, to really help benefit our community. I think that's that's tremendous out of the box thinking that uh, that really helps um, help us helps the city live up to its motto. Uh, the historical committee is continuing to uh, do what it can behind the scenes um, to uh, to archive and you know digitize uh, photos and articles and things like that. Uh, there's no meeting in January, uh, no meeting in February, and the next meeting is coming up in March. Uh, contact the committee if you'd like to share uh, family stories or old photos or volunteer to help. You can reach them directly at the following email address. It's easy, museum at berkeleymish.org, museum at berkeleymish.org. Uh, if you have uh, thoughts you'd like to share, if you want to set up a phone call to, to tell a, a few stories of, uh, uh, of days gone by, uh, those are important to help us chronicle uh, where we've been and, and uh, help uh, with our trajectory of where we're going. Uh, the Technology Advisory Committee meets uh, on February 17th at 6.30. And uh, on a related uh, technology note, um, kudos to um, Stan and the technology folks and our finance department uh, for rolling out um, a new ability that'll be available very soon. Uh, to look up your water and sewer accounts online and to pay your water bills online. Coming soon with what's called a, a point and pay solution. So uh, I think that's great. It's, a, it's a, an additional layer of, um, of convenience and ease for folks to not only look and see uh, their consumption of water, uh, but to, uh, to, to pay the bill without having the, to, to leave or, or go through the mail if, if that's your choice. So that's super. Um, and uh, the cyber tip of the month from the committee is uh, many of us are, are at home a lot more than we used to be and with families and, and um, movies and all these kind of gadgetry and all those things. Uh, if you find your network get to, to be bogged down a bit and you're curious what kind of throughput you're receiving these days, um, a fast, easy, free way without installing any applications is to visit a website called fast.com, F-A-S-T, fast.com. It's, it's hosted by, um, uh, who is it, Netflix. And it tells you how fast your connection is. Now there's apps that can do that, but if you don't wanna bother with an app or you wanna check another way just to see what's going on, uh, fast.com will tell you uh, what's going on. And then you can make decisions about, uh, about your broadband plan, I suppose. Or you could just go to the library and get the internet there uh, in the parking lot, which is awesome. Uh, the Downtown Development Authority, uh, their meeting is coming up next week's uh, Wednesday, uh, February 10th at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and uh, I have a couple of events to share there. Um, uh, while many folks will be uh, watching and celebrating uh, baseball season coming up in April, if that uh, baseball is not your scene, 
uh, then um, then we have a uh, uh, an opportunity to um, uh, go out to uh, you know go out to Berkeley here and do some shopping. There'll be two nights of shopping on April 1st and April 2nd. So I'll uh, plug this again um, as we get closer. But just to save the date, uh, there'll be uh, there'll be prizes and awards, and there'll be a digital map that says which shops are participating in uh, the Take Me Out to Berkeley event. Um, and so uh, uh, save the date for uh, April 1st and 2nd. If you have any uh, shopping that uh, can't wait, um, of course, go do that right now. Uh, but if you can, uh, enjoy that as well. Uh, and ahead of that, uh, you can um, begin the March into Downtown Berkeley campaign, March into Downtown Berkeley. Uh, for every $40 you spend at, uh, at select downtown businesses, you'll get $20 in Downtown Berkeley bucks. That's not too bad of a, of a return there. Uh, that will be, it's an ongoing, it's an event um, from March 15th through April 2nd. So that gives you a nice window there. And it, and it happens to include the Take Me Out to Berkeley um, event as well. So again, for every $40 you spend, you get $20 in downtown Berkeley bucks, which you can then redeem at all sorts of amazing places uh, throughout our downtown. That's a really good deal. Uh, so check that out. Um, if you go to downtownberkeley.com, you'll find out uh, more about these two programs and other exciting things. And, uh, and speaking of exciting things, I'd like, um, I'm sure my colleagues will join me in congratulating our uh, executive director, Jennifer Finney, uh, who today begins her maternity leave as she begins to, uh, to finalize those plans to, uh, to grow their family. Uh, so uh, congratulations and, and best wishes to Jennifer and Rick as they, uh, as they um, embark upon the final stage of that um, important journey there. Uh, and finally, uh, I usually like to include quotes of somebody that I can attribute them to, uh, but I found this on, Pin on Pinterest and I thought, you know, this is, this is pretty cool. So um, this has to do with, um, again, being safe and taking care of, of each other and helping live up to our community slogan of we care. Wearing a face mask is better than wearing a ventilator mask. Staying in your home is better than staying in the ICU. And washing your hands is better than washing your life away. So uh, now is not the time to, uh, to succumb to COVID fatigue. Uh, I'm very thrilled that the vaccine is making uh, its ways through the community and, um, and it's an important step forward. We've certainly, I'm going to get vaccinated as will my wife, um, but now is not the time to let our guard down. Uh, there's new strains and variants that are working their way into the country and, um, and and so it's, it's incumbent upon us to not only take care of ourselves and our family, but to take care of one another. And the way to take care of one another is to be vigilant, uh, to wear a mask, social distance, um, stay home when you can, um, wash your hands, uh, because um, you know somebody loves you uh, and I'm sure that they would want you to be around. So, uh, so let's do what we can to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, with that, uh, thank you all very much, take care. Well, thank you, Council Member Baker. And before uh, I move on to Council Member Price, as you mentioned, um, Executive Director Jennifer Finney, not only uh, did she have her baby, and Mr. Baumgarten made me aware of this earlier, her dedication and commitment to our community, very difficult for anybody to beat this. She sent an email after her water had broken to make sure that what she needed to take care of or any questions were answered before she actually went to the hospital. So, I mean, it doesn't get much more dedicated than that. Certainly those of us who've been through that process, I can tell you the last thing I would have been thinking about was that, uh, but that shows her commitment. So again, and congratulations, Jennifer. We, sir. we do hire the best around here, yep. Council Member Price. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Oh. Hard to top that um, and coming so close to last, I might be repeating a few, but I do want to point out that uh, today, in addition to the kickoff of Black History Month, today also marks the return to in-person learning for most Berkeley elementary students and the return to in-person dining at Michigan restaurants. Um, as Council Member Baker mentioned increased distribution of vaccines of course it helps protect individuals 
and slows the spread of COVID, but we must continue to wear masks, avoid gatherings, and keep our distance in order to keep ourselves and others safe, keep those kids safely in school. Um, I wanted to mention too uh, that our library continues to innovate and expand the services offered to cardholders. As of January 13th, you can now use your card number and your PIN to access Ancestry's Library Edition from home. Its databases include census records, vital records, immigration rec records, and more. The library is also hosting a Zoom workshop on how Ancestry can help you learn more about your family's history. That workshop is next Thursday, February 11th at 7 p.m. And then on Tuesday, February 23rd, the library Zoom account will host author Robert W. Feisler, who will read from his book called Tinderbox, the untold story of the upstairs lounge fire and the rise of gay liberation. You can register for these and other upcoming events on the library's website or by calling during the library's regular hours. And then finally, like so many others, I want to thank Mayor Pro Tem Dean and Chief Kane and all the others who helped form a high risk response team in order to protect and help victims of domestic violence in our community. Many individuals and our community as a whole is now stronger because of your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. And Council Member Blanchard. Thank you, Ryder. Just a couple of quick things tonight. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce in their uh, email blast today put out things I wanted to reiterate. Uh, one is off to the races is coming up this weekend. As you all know, we have, we're sponsoring along with Huntington Woods uh, City Commission a a uh, race, so that's going to be fun. Off to the race, off to the races goes virtual. That's going to be February sixth at seven p.m. Uh, is sponsored by the Berkeley Education Foundation, and they raise funds to support our schools during COVID-19, uh, learning through staff innovation grants, dollars to support staff and students while remote learning and stepping in to fill financial gaps uh, where needed. So this money goes right back to our students and stays in our community. So if you can participate in that, that would be great. The other item that's coming up, uh, the chamber was, was pushing was a seminar on understanding your social security benefits. That's being put on on Wednesday, February 10th by Eagle Rock Insurance Company. If you want to register for that, you can contact Eagle Rock on 11 Mile and they can get you registered for that. So those are the two things that are coming up uh, that are important. And I also would like to congratulate Bridget for the great, great job that she's done. She's been talking about this for a long time and I'm glad to see it come through, Bridget. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Many of the wonderful things mentioned by uh, our city council members this evening uh, can be found in the newsletter, which uh, comes out the first of every month, thanks to the hard work of Tori Mathis. Uh, so you can find point and pay information in there. You can find library information, recreation information. Uh, there's also a wonderful piece uh, on Justin Frost, who uh, was retired from Berkeley as a sergeant uh, to go do some, uh, some more police work with Oakland County Sheriff's Department. Uh, so if you want to read that piece, it, it talks a little bit about all the wonderful things that he has done uh, for our department and for our community over the years. And uh, we could have filled pages upon pages uh, of Justin Frost stories. Uh, department was able to come together and have a nice going away party for him, uh, attended by current and former officers uh, who all knew Justin, uh, respected him, and, and we'll be sad to see him go. Uh, but we do know that he's going on to, um, to do some additional good uh, with the Sheriff's Department. So we're very grateful for that. So. Uh, all that and more uh, uh, in our, our monthly newsletter, uh, chock full of great information. Um, in addition to thanking uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dean as everyone else for her hard and diligent work, I've, I've got the chance to, to hear updates from her and, and certainly as she talks about it, the, the enthusiasm in her voice is, is contagious. So I know she put a ton of work into that. Um, and I also wanna thank Berkeley Schools as well. My, my kids were uh, one of the ones that went back to school today uh, felt completely safe from start to finish, uh, kept them active, kept them engaged. And I'm pretty sure they've had the earliest bedtime they've had in months uh, tonight, just because they're so worn out and ready to go for tomorrow. So 
uh, my, my sincere uh, gratitude to Berkeley Schools for everything that went into today. Uh, I thank you and my family thanks you. No, that's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Starin. Uh, thank you. Um, boy, hard to top most of all. I mean, pretty much everybody had uh, just some outstanding good news here. Uh, and uh, so I'm not even going to try to top that. No report from me this evening. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, I too want to thank the Mayor Pro Tem um, for everything that she did and, and her role in, in spearheading, making sure that we have a um, high risk response team in Berkeley. And I want to connect it to my next point, which is also that if you read the article, uh, Bridget mentions that she heard about this at the 99ML convention in Detroit in 2019. And now you've heard uh, over the last couple of meetings me mentioning uh, how involved and how well regarded our elected officials are. And that certainly continues now. Um, Council Member Baker uh, led a breakout session as well as being on the panel uh, on January 23rd uh, for the newly elected officials workshop presented by the Michigan Municipal League. Also earning his level three governance award. Level one was education, uh, level two was leadership. And so this is a, a theme that I, you know, I've mentioned over the last council meetings and, and we will continue to see in the future. Our council members are not only engaged, uh, but they're sought after to be integral components of training for newly elected officials across the state. And as we've seen uh, uh, today from, from council member Dean or from Mayor Pro Tem Dean, it's not only being there, but it's also taking what you learn from there and making sure that it's coming back to our community. Um, and I'm incredibly appreciative of not only the work that she has done here, uh, but also the work that our council members have done and continue to do across the state. Uh, I know this is, again, not the ideal way that we would normally honor folks, but our, our uh, consent agenda was packed today uh, with, with, with great news. And I want to take just a couple of minutes to mention those. First, I want to wish Ernie Scalzi uh, a very happy 100th birthday. Um, you know, we've, we've had a number of these as well lately. And I guess, you know, there is something in the water in Berkeley. It's phenomenal how many folks that we have uh, that are making it to, to triple digits. And I also want to make sure to thank Deb DeRosa. Um, she was on the news uh, almost a month ago now, um, but for her unwavering commitment to helping our community um, when we were in need through her hard work and determination in producing thousands of free masks uh, since the onset of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Her devotion to helping others, you know, Deb has shown uh, to be a true beacon of light in our community and, and an exemplary member of our community at large, and, and we'll make sure that um, she has that uh, proclamation make, recognizing her for incredible work that she's done. Also on the consent agenda was our proclamation uh, declaring February as Black History Month in Berkeley. As we continue to work towards becoming a truly inclusive community in which all citizens, past, present, and future, are respected and recognized for their contributions and potential contributions to our community, the state, the country, and, and in fact, the world. We call upon our community to celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by African Americans to our economic, cultural, and, and spiritual and political development, and to really celebrate our diverse heritage. And mind you, that heritage has not always been candy canes and rainbows, as many of us are aware of, including in our own community. Um, the learning, understanding, and our continued efforts to create a world that is more just peaceful and prosperous for everybody. In uh, some good news, the American Legion post 374 will again be providing the fish fry dinners that we have uh, come to love here every Friday during Lent. Those will be from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, beginning February 19th, which is why I wanted to make sure I mentioned that uh, today because we will not be back with you before then, but February 19th to 26th, March 5th, 12th, 19th, and the 26th, and, and ending on Good Friday, uh, which is April 2nd. They will be primarily takeout, you know, in the past, uh, making sure that they've taken every step to ensure the safety of not only those picking up, uh, but the small dining area that they have uh, will be very socially distant. Um, and they've also set aside rooms uh, that are socially distant for folks to wait. As you know, it is a very popular spot, and sometimes you have to wait a few minutes 
Um, so they have set up making sure that you are safe while you're waiting as well and not piled on top of each other. Uh, and lastly, I want to give a shout out to our public safety department for their continued support of the Michigan Special Olympics today by being bold and getting cold. I'm sure many of you have already seen the video, uh, but today they held their virtual polar plunge. The event was live streamed so everybody can enjoy uh, as Tower 4, manned at a very safe distance by Lieutenant Corey Miller, safe enough from the cold. He also seemed to be sufficiently bundled up as he doused his colleagues, Sergeant Dennis Geary, uh, retired Sergeant Pete Kelly, uh, Public Safety Officer Justin Tildry, Public Safety Officer Rob Kwiatkowski, Lieutenant Andrew Hadfield, and of course, Chief Kane. Um, very notable was the first one to back out, um, a lieutenant who will remain nameless, but also the, the perseverance of the chief, who honestly looked like he could stand there all day, um, was not bothered at all. Yes, he did have um, a sort of a wetsuit, and he may have had goggles and a rubber ducky as well. Um, but as of this evening, look, the reason that they're doing this, obviously, is to raise money uh, for the Special Olympics of Michigan. And as of this evening, they've raised $2,669, are currently 15th in the state, but number one in Oakland County, uh, trying to hold off a, a late charge by the Clawson Police and Fire Departments, who are ganging up on them and are only a few hundred dollars behind them. Uh, they would certainly appreciate any donations, if possible, uh, to help the Special Olympics reach their goal of $500,000. If you haven't, please check out the video. I believe it is on the city's book page, the old Facebook, uh, Public Safety and the City, as well as a link to donate, um, should you be so inclined. And with that, uh, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Support. Support. Motion made by Council Member Baker with support from Council Member Blanchard. Ms. Mitchell, would you please call the roll? Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Price? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Dean? Yes. Turbrack? Yes. The February 1st, 2021 meeting of the 38th Council of the City of Berkeley is adjourned. Good night, all. Good night.